Undo your mute. We did it. Here we are. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> it's so nice to meet you. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm pretty great too. I was just looking up our old emails. I think we've been talking since 2011. Wow. Interesting. Here's God. The first, the first real time conversation. <laughs> Fast. I thought you were holding a little lamb. <laughs> he's my little lamb. I've got my daughter's mochi, but he's sleeping on his little bed. My daughter's dog is here. So oh, cool. What kind is he? He's a Yorkie Shih Tzu. Oh, awesome. Two thirds Yorkie or maybe three quarters and then a, a quarter Shih Tzu, which calms him down a little. Yours is a Beagle? What have we got there? Oh, this is a little miniature Dachshund. Oh, hi, sweetie. <laughs> You're all color coordinated. <laughs> Are we? <laughs> you look like New York and I look like California out here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think there's a poem. Uh, in <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Were you born in California? Chicago. Well, I was okay. actually born. I was born in Corning, New York, but I'm from Chicago essentially. So, wow. yeah. Oh, wow, wow. When did you first fall in love with words? Oh my heavens! Well, you know, it's a funny thing, Lauren, that you asked that because <clears throat> I was a very silent child. <laughs> I didn't speak very much in school. All of the teachers would say, Sue's a very good student, but she doesn't <laughs> participate in class. And I haven't shut up since. <laughs> so I, th I would think we'd have to say it was when I was 13. Uh, how about you? Oh, I guess if I was writing songs, they'd started at 10. So, 10, um, wow. Yeah. I don't know if I became so aware of words necessarily that, you know, since it was songs that was starting with guitar, but what what happened at 13 that-, that oh, I, I was just looking to see, I, I've had some things stolen, but um, my first journal uh, was stolen in a workshop. Uh, I had a teacher named Mr. Maybe, but it's spelled <laughs> M-A-B-I-E. I just talked to him yesterday. He's 94 now, wow. and uh, we, we reconnected uh, when Poem Crazy came out, and he assigned a diary, and he assigned, I'm going to shut this because I hear a dog barking, he assigned the diary of Anne Frank, and my mother's maiden name is Frank, and my father, Theodore Frank, is from Frankfurt, <laughs> and very likely related to Anne, I've learned since. Wow. Because I met Meep Geese, the woman who hid the Franks. Uh, and she met me and she took a look at me. And when I told her where I was from, and she said, Yeah, I think you're related to Anne Frank. And oh, I've always been with her. Yeah. And so my diary, Mr. Maybe suggested we do it the same way Anne did it. And I made it a letter to Dottie. She wrote to Kitty. You're right. So I began writing to Dear Dottie. And I don't have it here, but I know it by heart. I, the first thing I wrote in my first diary was, my mother had already said, you quit, you quit everything. You quit, I've already quit Girl Scouts. I'd already quit ice skating. I'd quit piano. I'd quit gymnastics. I quit Bluebirds and Girl Scouts, you name it. And I was, you know, I was all of 13 years old. <laughs> but I think our parents say things like, well, you've got to stick with something. And uh, so the first thing I wrote was, dear Dottie, I've never had a diary before, so I hope I can keep this one up. Knowing me, probably not. <laughs> How did it go? Did you keep it up? <laughs> and it's the only thing I have, I mean, yeah. I mean, not only did I keep it up, it's my life. And, and everything I've done, everything I've done has come out of my journal and my diary. And it's it's in a very different form now, just just today I was taping in all these petals and I've been finding four leaf clovers. Oh, wow. Because I may have a new agent. I'm spilling the beans, but we'll see for the book I'm working on now. But so I draw in it. I have an inner guide named Josie. There she is. That's um, fantastic. I'm kind of bored with all only words now. So I, I have to have a picture on every page. 
That's and fantastic. And I use colored, colored pencils. Do you I keep it? Do you keep those? I, I, I do. I was given a journal uh, for Christmas, I think, when I was fourteen, and I've kept it ever since. So for a while, I think I have every day written down till I was twenty-four, and now I have sort of highlights up until sixty-three. Currently, I'm still writing in it. And I have like 54 volumes. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I, I, I got about 150, <laughs> but it depends. Some are short for many years. And I like to share this with people because in my experience, people often don't start a journal because I always talk about them in my workshops because they feel like they have to catch up. Oh, they make up for lost to all those years. Yeah. And, and if you start even a, two days ago, mm. Like I want to write about this agent thing, but it's already two days old. <laughs> we're we're bored with anything that isn't present. So I tell people, well, you know, if you if you've got a hangnail or a splinter, now, <laughs> write about that. <laughs> What's out the window? Oh, look, the toyons in bloom, and I see seven bees, one, two. Um, <laughs> but if you try to catch up, you'll you won't. Yeah, it's too much work. <laughs> So, but I like to show people that for many, oh, this is when I was flipping out. Can you tell? Um, I started in lock diaries. Well, Mr. Maybe's was a spiral notebook and then lock diaries, which are disastrous <laughs> in, for me because you get one page a day and you're either behind or you don't have enough room. Did you keep those for a while? Oh, I don't think I had that kind, but you mean it has like a little date and only a small space? Today. Yeah, it's too limiting. <laughs> but I had, I did that for two years. And then I had a really hip boyfriend who just died, actually, Richard Breyer. Oh. And he, in fact, he's the reason everything got stolen because he gave me one of the, the maybe the original Howl by Allen Ginsberg. Wow. And in a workshop, I made the mistake of saying, this might be worth a lot of money. Oh, I was at a community college and they stole my entire little packet, which had my first diary, my little books of poems, Howl. Oh, no. You know, maybe it's just as well. I have kids. That way they don't have to deal with it all. <laughs> but Richard sat next to me in English and he handed me a note. She held the frailest winds in her arms and her toes which danced were stars. And so of course I swooned. And then, and then in German class, he, he gave me this note, German's a conglomerate of gutturals and belchery, a quarter irritation in the belly of a vocal cord. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it was terrific. And he was very hip and we, we wandered off a, a lot together. And that's when I started my little black books when I was with, hanging with Richard Breyer. And I kept these for many years. And, and this is what I almost recommend to, to people. They now make them, they used to be plastic for a while, but now you can get them, right. here's, you can get them like the original Mead and, and that you can get, this might be too small for a lot of people, but mm. um, you can get bigger ones. What's nice is they're loose leaf. Oh, right. And the other wonderful thing is you take them everywhere and then you're at a meeting where you're supposed to be listening <laughs> and you get to pretend like you're listening. In fact, you're listening so well that you're taking notes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm never bored because I've got my journal. And yeah, you know, yeah. I'm writing a poem about what's out the window or I'm catching every <laughs> word. <clears throat> or I'm catching noun verbs, which are my current favorite. Noun verbs. What are those? In my in my new book, I'm calling them nerves. In in Fool's Gold, I called them um, vernu because it sounds funny. Verb noun vernu. It sounds French. <laughs> <laughs> but they're words that are both nouns and verbs. And and you know we're always we're in love with long words like ephemeral, but the potent words are like tip, punch, swing, leap. And you can tell if they're a noun verb by putting two in front of it, then it's a verb, two tip, two leap, two swing, two punch, or the in front of it, the punch, the leap. the. So that's a way to tell. Oh, cool. And they are really, uh, some of the best writers, I don't know if you love Anthony Doerr the way I do. He wrote, 
Adorable. All the way we cannot see in Cloud Cuckoo Land. And I fell in love with his first book. And I've had too much coffee, Lauren, forgive me. But Please keep going. This is Shell Collector. And his first sentence, almost every word in it is a noun verb. Oh, I love it. And he doesn't know he's doing that, but you sure? Scrub, <laughs> scrub and grind and they're I got obsessed with them because Mr. Maybe, I had a major affair with Mr. Maybe when my marriage ended. And he fell in love with a woman who wrote Poem Crazy. Never mind, he found me in the strangest way, but <laughs> he was reading Alan Watts to me. And Alan Watts was saying that the Chinese have many more, they think in nouns and verbs, and they have many more noun verbs than we do. So I became obsessed mm. with collecting noun verbs. They're fantastic. So that would be another word bag for you, the noun verbs. Well, when I'm in doing workshops, I suggest that people aim for noun verbs. Yeah. I'm because looking I remember at it. In Poem Crazy, you were talking about the word bags, all the nouns, all the verbs, all the adverbs, all the adjectives. There they are. <laughs> I talk about this. The amazing Why? thing, I, I talk about this velvet bag of words and it's bottomless, Lauren. <laughs> Can put I put them in. I've been putting them in. Here's a really old one. It's pale blue. It says battalion size. Ooh. <laughs> fun with that one. It's a battalion size lamp, you know. And <laughs> the newer ones are I have some orange ones and special holiday offer. Special battalion size holiday offer. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So yeah, this is a empty that's a good one there you go um i like the velvet bag too what do you like the bag velvet bag <laughs> i had them in a gourd i think i mentioned in home crazy my dog ate the gourd so <laughs> bag, no matter how many i put in it seems to be able to hold them <laughs> that's great but how did all this love of words and uh noun verbs start turning into poems how old were you when you started writing poems you know the the love of words i didn't realize till later um the excitement of words more when i started teaching but i started writing poems same thing it was mr maybe who as i, I talked to him yesterday he's 94 now he was my freshman high school english teacher and he <laughs> recognized something in me and he had me I was very shy I never spoke in class but he had us write a poem or two and he recognized that I maybe that I was a poet so he had me starting writing poems instead of taking his tests <laughs> and unfortunately those poems a lot of them were stolen in that packet oh um, but I, I I have one that I wrote about my Greek boyfriend later, and I realized, no, I wrote the poem then, and then it was about something that happened later. I think I know a little bit of it. It was on the beach in the darkness, a whole world of our own, together standing motionless, the sand shall be his throne, and I shall be his woman in the darkness there alone, which is 13-year-old. <laughs> But I also, wow. as I wander along the harbor, watching the scowling, sweat-drenched men work for payday and praise, you know, and so Jack recognized that this was unusual. And, <laughs> right. and then 30, awesome. 30 years later, he fell in love with, with me on the basis of Poem Crazy. So That's fantastic. <laughs> and now we're like best friends, so. Absolutely. And do you have fool's gold? There's a lot of magic in the world, people. And so much magic. I know. <laughs> I love that. And, and don't you feel like you're going into the realm of magic when these words start flowing for you and the ideas start coming? There's a definite... Bob Dylan talked about it in an interview. He talked about the early songs he was writing, and he called it a penetrating magic. It was beautiful what he said about it. Wow. But I think... And that's where a song comes in. And Ezra Pound said something about poems have to have song in them. Music is the most is the most magical, I think. Mm. And when we sing things, yeah, 
And so There's I, definitely music in lines for sure. I agree. Yeah, and I write little. I always wrote little songs. Oh, you know? really? <laughs> I didn't know that. Uh, well, most of what I write is not out in the world. I mean, I realize right now I'm, I'm Me finishing too. the book, and I have <laughs> notes of things that that aren't going to go into it. But yeah, when I was married, I wrote a little song. It's kind of pathetic. <laughs> I'm here in your arms, but I'm lonely. I'm close to your heart, but I'm lonely. I've grown to my dreams, but the loneliness seems to have grown along softly inside me. To have grown along softly inside me. Oh. <laughs> Dead. Uh, oh. My goodness. And I have it. So there's total magic in songs because this is one other. When my children were little and my grandmother was in a retirement community and really wanting to die, she was 94. <clears throat> I went into my daughter's room and I wrote down a poem to my grandmother. I called it Home Song. And then a melody came and I sang it that night. And my grandmother died that night. She died. So I can sing you that song, and then I'd like to hear one of yours. It's called Home Song. Oh, Lord, the quiet, beyond the quiet, my pale cocoon, Lord, so slow the weaving. I've known dark tunnels with roaring traffic. Now I need rain, Lord, so soft and windblown. My Lord, so warm light, I'm coming home. Lie down in sweet grass, breathe deep the tender. My home, the forest, my home, the sea. Oh, Lord, the quiet, beyond the quiet. Oh, Lord, keep calling so deep in me. So it's a song of passage and, I, you know, and who knows whether I was picking up on my grandmother dying or she was picking up on my song, wow. but song is so much more than we, you know, we, we, we sing, but the native <laughs> people, it was invocation. Mm. It's, it's, it brings forth magic. Yeah. You're Italian, but the Jews sing everything, you know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Ehud. I think it's the best way to reach spirit, don't you think? Oh, yeah. That's why there's chanting and, and meditation and right. Because well, I think part of it, like, I just learned that a low, nice, sustained note uh, helps revitalize your... Uh, is it the vagus nerve? I think it sort of helps put your body in a different state so that you can relax more because sometimes more of us are breathing through the right nostril rather than the left. And it's the left that is attached to the side that is for relaxation and, and more of a calming state of being. And most of us just live in that right side, just on all the time. Oh, <laughs> but it, I thought that was interesting. I just heard more and more that Modern healing methods are all going to involve frequency, tone, sense. frequency, electricity, um, and that the old, you know, I think before long surgery is going to be out unless someone's been in a bad accident, you know, we're going to use a song. I'd, I'd love to hear one of yours, Acapella. Can you sing us uh, one that you like? Do you have one that in particular might seem like a song of passage or invocation? Song of passion. I mean, uh, passage, passage. invocation, a song that, that mm. maybe. Oh, what the heck? Just sing anything you'd like. <laughs> oh, what the heck? <laughs> I have so many, and it's like I've never I been able to sing one a cappella. Let's see. What you you don't have to, sweetie. If you've got your guitar there, go ahead, whatever you'd like. Yeah, right. You know? Um, yeah, you haven't heard any I, probably. I set right? a really low bar for us. <laughs> <laughs> You probably haven't heard any of my songs. I didn't even know. I have, your song. I, I have uh, because I've listened to you on YouTube, but not recently. And I yeah. should have 
Yeah, I'd love to hear something recent if you have one. Or something what do you recent. most love or what moves you the most? Uh, well, I love that you were talking about frequency there because um, I feel like that's everything with life and magic and frequency because sound waves cause us to feel the energy. We get goosebumps. We respond. Our, our nervous system joins in. We get an emotion instantly. Music is like the only art form that reaches your nervous system without your permission. You know, it's, <laughs> it's like... And I'm writing this, I take notes in my own interviews, but music is the only art form <laughs> that reaches your, I'm going to quote you here, okay. that reaches your nervous system without your permission. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, you can go to a museum and you can look at a painting and you can choose to take it in or not take it in, but you could be walking down the street or walking through a store or, you know, a song comes on in the car and you just find yourself emoting and you don't even know what just happened it's like wh how did that happen who who made who said that was okay <laughs> like wh why am i laughing why am i crying why am i whatever you know it's very manipulative in that way so, I, know, I never would have thought of that but except for most of the time we have a choice not to listen i mean i remember there's a, a mozart rondo that i love so much it's called rondo in a minor mm. And once it came on the radio, and yeah, I just started sobbing. I had to pull my car to the side. Yeah, M Rondo in A minor. But it gets very serious, and and then it goes up, and it's very beautiful. I don't yeah. always love Mozart, That's but so I love cool. Rondo. It's very cool. So I anyway, uh, go ahead, sweep us away. Sweep us away. I can't I can't even think of one right now. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. I want to sing. It's okay. You yeah. might not want to. Yeah. I have a whole list somewhere, you know. I, I just released a new album, in fact, so it's like I should know one of them. <laughs> the first song on the album. Do you know? Yeah, what is the first song on the album? <laughs> This well, is an you know, example, guys. I just want whoever's listening. This is an example of <clears throat> a non-egoic performer. Look at look at her. Look at Lauren. Rather than <laughs> leaping to promote her new album, she can't even remember <laughs> the first song. I, I love that. I love that. <laughs> I think it's funny. Well, that's, it's, it's just uh, it's just interesting. Well, uh, one of the things I had heard and threw into a song recently but had been saying for years was congratulations on another fine trip round the sun instead of saying happy birthday so i wrote a song called birthday song off the new album and that got one of those if i could pull up the lyric i might be able to remember the second line <laughs> <laughs> i just happen to have this rose here because i've been putting rose petals because i spilled coffee in my journal and i decided to cheat and cover up the coffee with rose petals that's but a great idea but the rose, and yeah. I put petals in my journal all the time, but, but the rose has the highest frequency, apparently, of any flower. Really? It's an enormously healing flower. Oh, and that's beautiful. In, fact, uh, in the Berkeley Psychic Institute, they, they suggest, I was sort of trained a little bit in that, that when there's something happening around you that you don't like, protect yourself, even with, with an imaginary rose, just surround yourself with roses oh that's a great idea <laughs> yeah and especially in a sphere because spheres are very healing oh, but cool. so i'm i'm just happy i have this rose here right now because isn't it beautiful and it is that's so great and i thought i had heard something recently where people said there's like a language of flowers and not only energy but like you can hear them speaking and they actually have feelings and i was like Wow, this is getting really cool. <laughs> well, I know that's true of bees. Mm. They're finding bees are much more intelligent and emotional than we thought. But um, every species. Uh, more, and more, more and more I talk to my flowers. I have this orchid in the bathroom and it's reaching out to me and it's so beautiful. And I just thank them. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great. Well, I just saw a video with a woman who was helping uh, in a wildlife sanctuary. Uh, raise a little baby bat named Eddie and she became very attached to this little guy and he was the most affectionate thing you've ever seen if you look up on YouTube 
this bat named Eddie. It's the cutest thing ever. And it seems like every species actually is emotional and very caring and loving. And, you know, that, that one movie, uh, Microcosmos, was unbelievable a bunch of years ago. They were even showing mosquitoes, you know, making love. And it was filmed so gorgeous that you were like, Oh my God, like this is, this is, this is love. This is amazing. And they're mosquitoes, you know? <laughs> wow. Wow. There's wow. so much we don't know and don't see, you know, but they invented all these tiny little cameras to get into all these beautiful places. There's a around book. And everywhere. It's amazing. There's a book, I think it might be called The Kinship with All Life. I can't remember the title, but it starts with a man and his relationship with a fly that, that became a, kind of his pet fly and it would <laughs> it would land on his finger and then there's a wonderful I bet you could find it on YouTube a woman found a bee that had a one wing or a damaged wing and she adopted this bee and it would sleep on her hand and I mean she she mourned when it died I mean oh. it, uh, bees are amazing you know a lot about them I think it was a bee <laughs> into my book but um I have this burned down ranch that I bought <laughs> <laughs> and we're gradually restoring it, but um, it had a dead swimming pool, which we've restored. And awesome. And one day I was swimming and bees tend to, I have all these flowers on the edge of the pool. They tend to fall in. And one day I was swimming and uncharacteristically bees just started, started harassing me a little bit on the, and I was trying to kind of brush it away. I love bees. I didn't want to hurt it. I'm not afraid of them, but it kind of was nudging me deeper in the pool. And the next uh -huh. thing I was eye to eye with a bee that had fallen in the water. And I lifted it out on my finger. It took a second to dry a little and the two flew off together. Oh, that's great. So it's like the bee pushed me to rescue its friend. Oh, I think so. Absolutely. <laughs> I was a little kid in a four foot little pool, I'm standing in the water and there was a tiny little bug freaking out in the pool. And I went to pick it up thinking, oh, you'll be okay. And it bit me. <laughs> I was like, I'm trying to rescue you. <laughs> What's the matter for you? <laughs> well, sometimes when you try to rescue something, you inadvertently kill it. Well, I put my hand under and came up under the water. So it was like- in so a bit pool. You. It bit you, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it was tiny. It was a baby bee. It didn't know. <laughs> don't give up, honey. Well, <laughs> they don't bite. It stung you. Yes. But, and the thing about bees stinging is that they don't do it. They must have been pretty panicky. Yes. They don't do it unless they have to because it kills them. I know. And the only other time I was stung, I walked out onto my porch. And it used to be open then at the time, like not enclosed. And I just walked out to let the dogs out and a yellow jacket came out of nowhere and just stung the, my, my calf. I was like, what's up with that? You know, <laughs> yellow, yellow jackets don't die and they can attack. They're pretty bad. They, they can keep attacking too. <laughs> uh, they don't, they're not bees. They, they, uh, I don't like yellow jackets too much. Oh, okay. So uh, whoever's listening, have you noticed how sneakily Lauren has gotten out of singing for us? <laughs> You've done a lot of teaching, haven't you? <laughs> I you tell, I can you see participate. It's your turn. <laughs> well, I, I, I just thought you might want to. Um, and yeah, I wanted to, yeah. but, well, to okay. sing it, but maybe not. I no, guess I you... called it up. I found it. And it's got that line in it for the first one. So it was, congratulations on another fine trip round the sun. We've been elated at the charming ways that you've had fun. Life loves being you. Congratulations on another year where you belong. We are thankful for your open tears that made you strong life feels more through you oh happy birthday happy birthday to you oh happy 
happy birthday. We're so thankful for you. And then there's a little more. Not only is that lovely, but I noticed while you were singing it that you just changed. Oh, did I? <laughs> you came so alive. Not that you, you're a very alive person. Are you, you must be Italian. Are you part Italian or? All Italian, just pedigree, All Italian. Like three sides, pedigree Italian. <laughs> you know, I'm Jewish and my friend Jane said her husband lived in a kind of Italian Jewish neighborhood and, and he thought everybody was the same. And then he realized that the Italians were the happy Jews. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a funny way to put it. Yeah. I've always loved the similarities, especially in New York. And then between all the accents, unless they get some Yiddish in there, it's like the New York Italian Jewish thing. I can't really separate it. I just love it. It's just all such a wonderful sound and humor and, and fun. But what I never understood was when I was growing up, this is going to just sound so ignorant, <laughs> but I bet you'd be just the the gentle person to explain to me the difference. <laughs> but I know. I, used to, yes, I know. I used to think that Irish, Italian, Jewish, that they were all nationalities. And Jewish is not a nationality. It's a religion. And I think, but that doesn't make any sense because even people who've come from those beliefs use that word as if it's Italian, Jewish, Irish, German. I don't get it. You know, I, I, I think we're getting to the core. <laughs> if people don't like Jews, to be honest with you, because. Because it's a blend, it's a religion and it's a culture. And as a religion, everybody sort of secretly knows you can't become a Jew. <laughs> and, and people do they they convert. I mean, I'll probably be insulting a lot of people and making people angry who might be hearing this, but I, I think, you know, I'm, my mother was a German Jew and my father's family rescued my grandmother's family right before Kristallnacht. And so, you know, I've thought a lot about what's, why people, what's gone on with the Jews. Hmm. And, and in fact, one reason I bought this burned down ranch with my mother is I realized Jews were never allowed land. Oh my but, God. But people want to be included. I think the most basic human need is to feel included. Yes. And the Jews don't somehow allow people to feel included. And I mean, and even being labeled by Christians, like if a Christian, what, what the Seventh-day Adventist comes to the door and I'll say I'm Jewish to kind of deflate the whole thing. They'll say, but you're chosen. You're the chosen people. Even that. Is separating. Mm. is separating. And so anything that makes us feel like we can't play mm -hmm. is going to make people not like us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I mean, what do you think? Does that make sense to you? But so, so, it, so Judaism is a religion. It is a culture. It's, it's complicated <laughs> and there's nothing else quite like it. Yeah. I mean, I think Muslims get a little bit of that, but, but I think it's more, it's easier to become a Muslim. We could do it right now. I think we say it five times. <laughs> when I'm a Muslim. I'm a Muslim. I'm Muslim. I think that technically you're a Muslim then. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? That's great. I know. Do I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree. It's complicated. And I feel like sometimes things get complicated by folks who think they're intellectual and they make things complicated unnecessarily. I think a lot more things are very, very simple. And I especially agree with the, everybody wants to be included and be loved. And if they were, we wouldn't have half the disasters that we have because people wouldn't be acting out and lashing out in so much anguish from their trauma. Especially the men right now. I know it's such a traumatic thing. And, and, mm. um, and, and part of it, you're going to get me on my soapbox. <laughs> but part of it is the way we have children, because I think if babies were held, mm. were held and nursed, you know, I mean, I won't name leaders right now who are traumatic and traumatized, but they were, they were shunned as children. They were left out. They were bullied. They weren't loved. And it, then you don't value yourself. You don't value other people and you can kill them. Yeah. 
so much anger, like these young men going into school shooting. It's mostly young men. Yeah. They've been excluded. They, and they're so hurt and angry. They, so how, how do we include better? That's huge. That's right. That's right about that. Yeah. And I don't know, you know, it's like people think things were better in the past, but friends of mine are history buffs and they say it's always been awful and it's always been amazing and humans have always been absolutely horrendous and absolutely fantastic so it's it's like there's never been a better time and I always thought when I was a kid that generations got smarter and smarter and things got better and better and one of my friends said oh no not necessarily <laughs> well I'm hopeful I mean I'm I'm a California Pollyanna <laughs> and I'm very interested in astrology, which puts a lot of people off, but yeah. we technically are finally, truly, as of March, Pluto went into Aquarius and it left again. We're now back in Capricorn. It's going back into Aquarius in January and then fully into Aquarius in 2025 for 20 years. And it is literally the age of Aquarius. And apparently it's the end of a I thought it was a 2000 year period. People are saying it's a much longer period than that. And we're coming into a Kali Yoga, one of the good yoga yugas. <laughs> and we are truly potentially coming into a golden age. Oh, that'd be fantastic. And what I see is the emergence of the feminine in men and women. It's That's what has to happen. What Aquarius embodies is collaboration as opposed to competition <laughs> vision as opposed to short-sightedness i see it i see it among young people I, I and we have to just do our best to envision it and encourage it and be it and i think it could happen and I, i'm even excited about the whole ufo thing <laughs> and and keep that creative space that that it's uh, uh feels good and safe to collaborate in and to be safe in together and teaching songwriting teaching poetry yeah I mean, I've worked with some really pretty ragged kids in the juvenile hall that you know one of them comes to mind because what he learned from his father was how to murder and how to hotwire cars um but he had beautiful poems in him and mm -hmm. and have a creative outlet that allows other people to see your beauty that can be life-saving. Do you teach songwriting to young people, Lauren? I know you do teach. I do, college level. But okay. I, I do meet a lot of wonderful uh, students, and, and most of them are men, and they're like the best of the men that I ever meet, you know, because they are artists and, and they have good hearts. Have you thought of going younger? I used to teach folks that were much younger, but um, sometimes even these college folks are just younger and younger. <laughs> I've noticed that every, as the older I get, I mean, do you believe your dentist is like a teenager? <laughs> I know. Right. I'm 63. So it's like, what? I'm not even going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> my, my baby sister is 13 years younger than me and she's going to be 50 in the fall. And, you know, I held her like she was mine. So like, I just don't understand this. <laughs> Well, I'm in my 70s, honey, and it's not getting any any easier to be to be this age. But yeah, I if you could go into the schools, I mean, I wish we lived near each other because I used to bring a singer into the juvenile hall, my friend Stevie Cook, and he was able to take the poems and he would turn some into blues and some into rap and some into country and that and fun. That was when the kids were especially moved in the juvenile hall by like one kid, he wrote, I'm a, I'm a car stopped, I'm on a river. I can't remember the exact words, but when Stevie sang it, mm. my Tana who'd come with me was in tears. And the young man said, I did that. Well, wow. yeah. And I'm always trying to push people but if, if you could ever work in juvenile halls or anything like that or find it is there a poets in the school program are you in the city are you in new york city where no, are I'm you in, i'm near boston I, I live northwest of boston and i teach at berkeley college of music okay that's right and i didn't know where that was okay it's and in it, boston yeah well 
I just know that you'd be good. You'd be good with these, you know, because you've got that Italian warmth. You'd be good with the kids. And, <laughs> but we do what we do, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure. Starting in my 60s, I had less energy to do that than, than I used to. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I love creating so much. Sometimes I even want to do just less teaching and just more creating, more creating. Yeah. Yeah, I have a workshop coming up Saturday at Davis in the library. and. Nice. I'm not as pa patient as I used to be with what involves <laughs> setting it up and yeah. Well, you yeah. held up you held up um, poem crazy. Uh, could, could you hold up fool's gold too? Hold them both up. Yeah. Well, the problem with fool's gold is um, I didn't I didn't have an editor who even read it, and I've always hated the cover of fool's gold because it's a oh. Getty image, and I thought it was kind of like mimicking poem crazy with like a white blonde young boy which is <laughs> <laughs> opposite of what I am but so yeah. I didn't like the cover but people like the cover this one I, I kind of hate it this book had a lot of trouble and so just because it wasn't ready and it's a book about making collage boxes yeah doesn't have one illustration Oh, <laughs> they should have at least had some of your collage boxes in there. Excuse me? Is that... they, should, they should have at least had some of your collage boxes well, in there. That was the plan, and, and that was my <laughs> But the editor didn't do that because um, she ended up, we, we decided we could put something on the end pages, and she chose a, a journal page. So I'm constantly doing collage of one form or another. Those look so cool, though. Well, that's a flower one, but the boxes, this is not one of the boxes, but this is typical of what I would do in a box. I would find litter. Yeah, and keep those kind and, of papers. But you kind of need to be able to show people what you're talking about. Okay. It's so beautiful. It is and, beautiful, and then different textures too. Yeah, and so I kind of cleared up the park of litter. <laughs> I need a box every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing because you know a lot of times all the ideas seem nebulous, and we're creating out of nothing. And now you're creating out of pieces that actually help in the environment. <laughs> well, except the, the title of this book is "Making Something from Nothing." There because you go. Gold's gold, but let me let me show. I'll show you a couple of the boxes. But um, I have it on my phone. I think I can make it big enough. Well, have you ever worked with washi tape? Washing tape? Washi. I don't know what that is. Oh, hang on. I'm going to show you because a friend of mine just adores washi tape. Because here's and here's some of the boxes. Meantime, folks, while you're here, I'll show you some of the boxes. That's a bunch of them laid out. And then here, here's some of them close up. The very first one that I did. So Lauren, Fool's Gold opens with a, a box I made at Wisdom Beach and a fortune oh, wow. showed up inside of it. And it said, you have at your command, the wisdom of the ages. And I, I used Gorilla Glue on that one and it was a mess, but... <laughs> Like this one was just made out of pumpkin seeds that I found at a picnic site. Oh, look at that. And and I just wanted to show people, you know, it was whatever litter I found or seeds. And it was gorgeous. And I made so many. Mm -hmm. You know, I made one a day for a year. Wow. And so the whole book was about the boxes, but without one illustration. And and it was so frustrating because I don't think the editor of that particular book read it. You know, it's not even about beauty so much as about fun. Absolutely. And taking a bunch of junk and putting it together. And <laughs> this one's kind of like a painting with leaves. And wow. So I'm hoping I got paperback rights for that book. And I'm hoping this one was made out of acorn caps. It's kind of fun. I, I use containers. Oh, that looks so cool. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I wish there had been pictures. There's the book I about it with that one picture. I know. I have the book, and I, I didn't. I was never picturing anything like that. 
<laughs> That's so much cooler. Wouldn't it help to have some illustrations? Sure, sure. So we'll see. Well, uh, washi tape is just this roll of, of tape. We yes. can make infinite designs in different widths. So the, my friend has much more styles of it, but it doesn't stick very uh, firmly. So you can put it anywhere. I'm going to write this down. What, what, how's it spelled? W-A-S-H-I, I believe, or Y. Let me check. I can check. Whoa. So folks who are out there, I've already been writing down stuff. How can you live without a journal? Now get yourself a journal. <laughs> music, it, here I have written what, what Lauren said. Music is the only <laughs> medium that reaches your nervous system without your permission. <laughs> so you're going in my new book. <laughs> <laughs> whether you like it or not <laughs> okay you're gonna quote me on that though <laughs> i have seen that i think i'm getting cre credit for that line or what <laughs> oh of course yeah, that's fun that's one thing i do is i don't i, I love to credit people i would never yeah you don't it. About citing sources except the minute i get holier than thou and say something i mean i probably have stolen stuff but look at that wow they make anything anything that you're interested in they have all kinds of tape, and wow. um, you would love it for your journals. My friend puts it in her journals all the time, but she collects well, things like you do all over the place. Well, the problem I have with something like that, and it's, it, I'm such a snob, <laughs> um, is that I see, I mean, I on Instagram, there's a zillion people making journals and collages. And to me, I like it more when it's something personal to that person rather than like the tape is already done. It's already been made by someone else. It might be, it'd be fun as a part of something else, but oh, it's definitely a part. Yeah. Cause you, yeah. you put it on a page like a leaf or a piece of a flower. Oh, and it would enhance it. Yeah. It looks like a wonder. I'm going to, I'm going to get it some. enhances it. I mean, it, there are some that are from like famous artists and painters and textures and colors and designs. And it's kind of like Zen tangles. There's just infinite crazy things you can do. And what a fun thing to put on presents or put on postcards or letters if right. if ever were to mail them. <laughs> right. What is that? <laughs> yeah. Used to. My friend Polly is a total letter, postcard, mailbox person. <laughs> she gives me a hard time because I'm moving away from that. I, I've got three little grandsons and they oh. take a lot of time. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, tell me about favorite authors or how you got into writing then. How did your love of words and writing poems then turn into actually teaching and writing books and wow. a lot of reading? Um, you almost have to read Poem Crazy for that. But it, <laughs> I, the, the strange thing is I have always kept my journal. I've always loved language. I would... Let's see if, if this one might have a poem in it. I would, I just would find poems in the air. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not sure this one does. I mean, a liar of myself, but <laughs> um, no, here it is. Here's one that I was writing something in a poem, little poem. Uh, when I worked at the University of Illinois Press, I had a typewriter and I, yeah, here goes, here's one. Um, I don't know if you can see that that's in a poem form in an early journal. Yeah. And, they just sort of come to me. And I, and I write about poem crazy in the very first words of poem crazy are po poetry, poems arrive. Yeah. Uh, Pablo Neruda said, poetry arrived in search of me. I don't know where it comes from, a winter or a river. I don't know how or when. And it's kind of like that with me. It, it's yeah. just, um, what is this? <laughs> I've never, I haven't read this since. Whatever. <laughs> Was. This is like 1970. I was one. No. <laughs> <laughs> it just fear weary. I would try, smiling wide high, to enter a cave and walk further to the damp, blackening caverns of its old rock and light a candle to its plunging retreat. I haven't read this since. <laughs> Farther into the earth until the entrance light is but a dime, a pin. 
And then I, I, I cross out the rest of it. And then here's another one. Eyes askew. And I ask you, am I different grown up? <laughs> and so, you know, I, I just would think in poems. But the, the kind of sad thing is that, oh, this is one about my husband. It's a dense pace apart from you. I form the urgent words to you and wishing them through and into you. The dense hair holds them in. <laughs> I hear your sounds of sleep begin. Oh, that's really it's about cool. not communicating. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what happened is I lived poems. In fact, I just pulled out this because in my new book, I have a poem called I, I, I don't want to be good. And I found, I, I was looking through this notebook. I mean, I wrote thousands. I can't even tell you how many poems. And then Poem Crazy came out and I'm supposed to be an expert. And, <laughs> maybe, and I stopped writing poems. Oh. I don't write them too much anymore. I'm, I'm part of a little writing group called the Dark Angels out of England. And I write with them. But I, I, I it's sort of like, People expected me to be a poet, and I quit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're writing books. <laughs> yeah. And, you're, yeah. You're, you play with words, and you make journals, and uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I just don't do write too do many word puzzles and wordle and crosswords? No, like you know, I don't. I and never it, did either. <laughs> and the funny thing is, so many people who write use a thesaurus. I don't think I've ever once used a thesaurus. I don't well, think you know, I know <laughs> I've got a really funny little story about a thesaurus because when I was in college studying with Pat Patterson, songwriting lyrics class, writing better lyrics. Um, Look up. He said that we all had to buy a rhyming dictionary and a thesaurus. And I just thought, oh, come on. You know, if you can't pull these clever things out of your own mind, that's like cheating or whatever. But I bought the books. And then I was flipping through George Harrison's uh, book, I Me Mine, and he had this picture. And it's a picture of a box of chocolates. And on the <laughs> Beatles White Album, there's a song called Savoy Truffle. And I love these, these chocolates. Are you familiar with that song? No, but it's a found poem. Uh, let me read it to you. Cream Tangerine. Savoy truffle, toffee and cherry cup, coconut and caramel, pineapple treat, mon montelot, ginger fling, sling, almond sundae, nougatine cup, toffee green Brazil, coffee dessert, cream tangerine. Good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's a poem. So these were uh, Eric Clapton's favorite chocolates. I love it. And George was saying, you know, you really go got to go to the dentist because Clapton had really bad teeth and oh. he was always getting these cavities because he was always eating the chocolates, I guess, and not cleaning his teeth. And so George wrote this whole song. You'll have to have them all pulled out after the Savoy truffle. All your teeth will have to be pulled out. So he says, cream tangerine. Montelemont. <laughs> A ginger sling with a pineapple heart. <laughs> Coffee dessert, don't you know it's good news? And it, it's just, it's all, it's all the names of the candies, just like you did the poem. And I flipped because I thought, oh my God. Well, that's the whole idea is that poems are everywhere. They're just around us and found and He poems. made a lyric out of it. So it was like, if he can do that with a box of chocolates, <laughs> imagine what I could do with the entire English language with this thesaurus <laughs> and this rhyming dictionary. Like I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm a fan now. If you need an extra word and you're looking for the perfect rhyme that isn't just moon and June, you can, well, you can use you know, and, and I, I talk about, in Poem Crazy, I have a chapter, I, I have a hard time remembering the book, but I have a chapter about collecting words. Nice. And in practice, I talk about field guides. You know, the field guides are filled with poems. Window wing moth, globular springtail. There's a bug called a fire brat. Yeah. But then just to get the men involved, I'll read this paragraph. It says, my friend Tom's Ford pickup repair manual is chock full of great words. Luminosity probe, diesel throttle control tool, 
<laughs> acceleration pump link. I remember that. Internal vent valve, choke hinge pin. <laughs> no, that's a great example of noun verbs. The choke, oh. hinge, the hinge, to hinge, the pin, to pin, um, the tool, to tool, the swivel, to swivel, the link, to link, the pump, to pump. Wow. And so and the words like that, I don't think we're even quite aware, but they, they reach us. They, yeah. they, they're visceral. Yes, because you feel them. You see them and feel them. So, so you and I are on the same page. <laughs> well, maybe, <laughs> but I am an Aquarian. Getting back to that. When's your February, birthday? February 1st. Oh my gosh, I'm January 30th. Oh, look at that. Yeah. That's We're really so smart, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I just love your books and I'm, I'm just crazy about... Uh, your perspective on loving words and playing with words. And that's why anytime my students would think writing lyrics were too hard, I would just say, well, look, there's this great author. Her name is Susan G. Wooldridge. <laughs> and she says, you can play with words like they're blocks. You know, you can put them anywhere and meaning will take care of itself. And they just feel so free because of it. So you've turned on a lot of lyricists that I've encountered. And I've encountered over 10,000 students in the 40, almost 40 years oh that I've been teaching. Thank you so much. <laughs> so you generally recommend my book. I will I really say do. songwriters find it helpful. Because, you know, we take we take language, we take everything so seriously. And, and uh, mm. once you start playing, and oh, this is something I always bring out in my workshops. And I, I wanted to show you. Oh. Everyone's terrified of James Joyce, and especially, you know, I mean, Finnegan's Wake is the one that scares people the most. They're not much afraid of, uh, what's the one right before Finnegan's Wake? I'm going blank. Um, the very the very famous one, uh, Good Heavens, How Could I Be Forgetting? It's one of my favorite books. Starts to happen as we get older here. Um, no, you just sprung it on yourself. yourself Ulysses, so Ulysses is the, the really famous one, but Finnegan's Wake, people just can't stand it because it's so complicated. Well, the fact is the man is playing. He's playing <laughs> Romeo and Juliet, Jolio and Ramoon. Um, <laughs> he, he, listen to this. I always read this in my workshops. Well, he, he says, first of all, the timid hearts of words all exeomnunt, and then he has a bunch of made up words, managad, lamelui, how do that come? And then he says, <laughs> up louder main again, from the clearer of the air from on high has spoken and tumbled him, tumbled him to his tumbled him, tumbled doom world and magophonized by that phenomenon, the inhabitants of the earth have <laughs> rumbled from firmament unto fundament, and from <laughs> twiddly dums down to twiddly dees, loud hear us, loud graciously hear us, He's calling God loud. He's <laughs> in Judaism, the holiest of holies is the Ein Sof, and he spells it wrong. And in, in he sp we spell it E I N S O P H, and it's unspeakable. You you're not even supposed to write it, and he spells it. A I N S O P H, and he puts an asterisk, asterisk, and in the footnotes it says, group name for grape juice. <laughs> <laughs> so he's making fun of himself. He's making fun of religion. He's making fun of academics. He's making fun of books. And people want to figure it out. I know. They try too hard and they miss it, I think. They're missing it. Yeah. And then there's me making after fun meeting. of them. He's making fun of it all. <laughs> and it's so fun to just open the book and read a little bit like that. It's yeah. just, I love it. It's an, he's an Aquarius. How is he? Well, he's he? probably your birthday. I think he's February 1st or January 30th. Yeah. Very close. Wow. I'm, wow. I'm going to Google his birthday. We're really John Lennon used to do all kinds of fun wordplay things like that too. Yeah, yes. A Spaniard in the works and some of those crazy yeah, things on right. Choice. Have you uh, noticed uh, Ju Julia Louis Dreyfus has a podcast? Have, have you checked I out? I just said that she was just in a movie. 
Um, she's got a great movie. I can't wait to see it. It's it's called You Hurt My Feelings. If you watch the trailer, I was just was, I literally this morning read Anthony Lane's review of it in the New Yorker. A friend gives me her New Yorkers, and they didn't like it too much. Oh, uh, really? But um, the trailer looks good. It, it's, he said it would have made one good Seinfeld episode. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, I hope you're not listening, sweetheart. Yeah. Well, you got to check out her podcast. It's called Wiser, and she's talking to women, and it's just fabulous. Really? I mean, you got to hang that. with Carol Burnett and Jane Fonda and all kinds of folks, and I've really been enjoying that podcast. Have you ever thought of doing one? Well, you know, the funny thing is, I thought this was just hanging with friends, but a friend of mine keeps referring to it as my podcast. So maybe this is it. <laughs> but people can see us, right? Yes, because it's on YouTube. So is, isn't a podcast usually not uh... visual? But on YouTube, they have a separate channel. You can make a bunch of playlists and one is now called podcasts. So I think I could go on there live and we could just wing it, you know, and be on live. But you know, this is being recorded. So if there's a pause, like going to get washi tape, if you weren't showing pictures and still talking, I could edit out the space. <laughs> well, I showed a few of the boxes, but that still might want to be cut, you know. No, I'd like to keep the boxes. Well, do you, but I think I showed them to you again then. Do you, do you um, spend a lot of time editing or is it not too hard? It's not hard because there isn't usually much to, to change or fix. You know, someone has to get up and turn something off in the back room and then I just cut out the little bit of space or whatever. I didn't want it to be too much of a big editing thing. I was actually well, trying to look to see how you would turn these into the podcasts that are just audible, but they're, um, you have to convert these MP4s to MP3s and uh, there's a bit of a process. Well, and I like this conversation. We're just sort of winging it. We're not focusing <laughs> on anything particular. It's very Aquarian. <laughs> so James well, Joyce was born February 2nd. Okay. Look so he's day after you, but yeah, look, he's making fun of everything. You can see it in his face. <laughs> Catch me if you can, he's saying. Yeah. Nothing is that serious. Yeah. Um that's why I like the Beatles so much, because they were so happy go lucky in a lot of ways, you know. Just very playful. silly. So playful. Smart, playful, funny. Tell what do you me. think of the phenomenon of Harry Styles? I don't know much about it. Another Aquarian. Is he? Yeah. He's really cute. Like I, didn't, music? I didn't want to get a crush on him, but <laughs> <laughs> I joined. My daughter has a kind of a crush on him. And, and Google his, and, and those of you who are listening, Google his video making experience with James Corden. They make a video together for his one of his songs, If I Was a Bluebird. Um, and it's a very sweet video. James Corden got him in all kinds of trouble and, and made him do the, these crazy crosswalk concerts between cars in the middle of the street. And, um, oh, no. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's when I first discovered Harry Styles, and I found him pretty hard not to like. <laughs> that's pretty fun. We kind of want to, we want to not like people sometimes when they're real popular. <laughs> <laughs> when you said Harry, I thought you were talking, you're going to say something about Harry Potter. I liked those books a lot. And I thought to me, that was the next greatest big thing that ever happened since the Beatles. It wasn't in music. It was, it was in books. <laughs> well, it's totally affected. I mean, my grandchildren are nine and 11, about to turn 10 and 12. And they, my grandson Liam became Harry Potter. He had the glasses and the cape, and this, and now they're um, now they're Pokemon and Zelda. But <laughs> Potter really, really influenced. I mean, I'm they got me afraid of the Dementors. I'm I'm afraid to go down my stairs. I, I think I'm going to run into a Dementor. Keep the chocolate in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's not them. That Stop. revives you. <laughs> I don't know enough. I just know enough to be kind of scared. I'm, I'm, <laughs> you haven't when, seen the movies either. It's the first one especially is just adorable. I saw the first one. Yeah, I've seen, but it's been a while. Um, yeah. It's time. I know it's such a phenomenon. And people are wanting to give her a hard time right now. And come on, humans, be a little more forgiving. I know. 
How about movies? Do you have favorite movies? Not a movie I, person. I, I haven't. I'm getting a little behind in movies. There's, it's a well, little I'm bit not of, on top of anything. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going all the way back to Napoleon Dynamite and and a, a movie called Red by a, an Italian director. And I mean, I can go way back to Knife in the Water, and I can yeah. And E.T. I re I we rewatched E.T. Oh, I, I'm, I should rewatch I'm that. Peter Coyotes, and he played the doctor in E.T. Oh, cool. Have you seen E.T. recently? Not recently, but you're making me want to. <laughs> or well, Close Encounters. That would be fun to see again. Well, because, I mean, this whole, are you following the whole E.T. thing that's happening right now? No. They're calling the UAPs now. Okay. The UFOs. Well, everyone's getting dissed, but there are more and more pilots and Air Force people coming out and talking about what they've experienced and and what's really out there and and that uh, and I kind of believe it. I can't believe that we're the only only Google it. Google a guy named uh, David Grush, G R U S C H, and what he's saying, and a guy named Greer, G R E E R. Okay. And Lou Elizondo, who left the Pentagon because he felt things were being needed to be disclosed. Oh my goodness! So I, I think ETs are all Aquarians. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of my favorite movies are The Truman Show and uh, Back to the Future, Pleasantville, Cinema Paradiso. Oh, I love that! I haven't seen it. That's oh been years on that one that's a good one and i just recently saw 52577 did you Is see that, that a great one that's a great one i'm um, right down well as a creative person and growing up and and having a creative life and not many people around you understand you i i related <laughs> 52577 i don't i haven't even heard of that one i'm a little bit out of the loop i hadn't heard of it either it just sort of came up and i watched the trailer it was suggested to me, I guess, in one of my playlists. What did I even see it on? What channel? Might be Showtime. It's just, just great. Such a great film. I think my a young, a young my filmmaker. Speak to the Royal Tenenbaums. Did you ever see that one? That I've was heard the movie. title now. I have to check that one yeah. out. But I haven't seen any of the new ones. I, I well, I saw Wonder Woman, the first Wonder Woman. I didn't know it was a World War II movie. It was pretty intense, but of course. I fell with Gal Gadot. <laughs> Have you seen any of the Gal Gadot's movies? No. She, do you know who she is? No. She's she's an amazing Israeli actress, and she did Wonder Woman and played Wonder Woman without a stunt person very much. And and I, you might want to. You might want to. You were going to say without special effects, like she really flew. <laughs> there were a lot of special effects, but she did most of her amazing her own stunts. Movies. Wow, and it's worth just seeing it for her. But do know the Wonder Woman movie? It's fairly intense. Okay, wow. And I, I generally avoid those. Though I, I love Schindler's List. I love some of them. So oh, I know, I saw that, and that just tore me up. But uh, yeah, I loved it. Perfect. Uh, what your favorite what's... musicians? And and we are we? Did you want to go for an hour, honey? We're a little bit over. I don't know. Anything you'd like. Okay, Never you can ask me a question. Yeah, I was going to say, what sustains you? What what helps you keep being you your whole life? I have this balcony, <laughs> and I have a garden. You can't really see it. I have this amazing garden. I bought this burned down ranch, and I would have to say the birds and the bees and my grandsons, but. I'm basically manic depressive. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, and this new book finally comes out and talks about a major breakdown I had when I was 20 that was intense. You know, sort of locked up like a one flew over the cuckoo's nest for months. So I'm basically, so I would say nature, barefoot, I'm barefoot all the time. <laughs> See, I, I would find it hard to live in, in a city. I, I yeah. don't do it. Yeah, I don't city either. So you're not in a city? 
No, no, definitely not. I'm out northwest of Boston in the woods, 43 miles out in the woods. And oh, you're in the woods. Yeah, so I'm just surrounded by trees. And the houses are pretty far away from each other, which is lovely. So I can play drums at two in the morning and nobody would call the police. So, so you're also sustained by nature then? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, I love taking a big tarp out in the backyard on the grass and just laying down on the ground. <laughs> well, that's my new my new thing is grounding and and uh, I've heard good things about discovering that. that most illnesses that are inexplicable, especially like Parkinson's, even diabetes, they don't understand MS, are caused by inflammation. Mm -hmm. and when we're on the earth barefoot or lying on the earth. So yeah. just lie in a plastic tarp. Could you lie instead on a... I was on cloth. It was a... Um, oh, perfect. Yeah. Like a moving blanket, basically. Yeah. It literally hums. Do you feel yourself starting to hum? Almost be, your body? It'd be nice, yeah. <laughs> but it heals inflammation. Oh, and that's great. And most illnesses start with cells being inflamed. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But doctors don't necessarily tell us this because you can't, you can't charge for them. having people lie down on the earth. Well, that's what I say about music schools and stuff like that. They can only charge you for the intellectual part. But most people attend a college like that because music moves them so much and they feel so much from it. And it feels like magic to make those sounds and to listen to music. And they come there and it's just all brain stuff and, and all the magic seems to go away. And I say, well, the, the magic part is the human you know, it's the person. You got to put that back in to all the knowledge and have it come out you in a natural way and it becomes all beautiful and magical again, you know? Interesting. Yeah. So, so when people get to school, do you know the violinist named David, oh, I'm going blank on him. He's German and he went to Juilliard, uh, what is his name? He's really famous. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I don't remember his name. Um, but I think he had a little trouble with music school. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> did you? Did you go? Where did you? Where was your I attended, I attended Berkeley as well from 1978 to 1982. I was a student. And then they hired you sort of directly? Uh, they wanted to, but I had to wait two years for an opening to be in the guitar department. So I started in 1984. So guys, go to Berkeley School of Music and get Lauren Passarelli. <laughs> <laughs> and, you'll find, and you'll find that penetrating magic. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really cool place if you can remember to just look after yourself and like start and end the day and start and end the day under the headphones, like remembering who you are, you know, and listen yeah. to the things you love and. Well, and is it very competitive? Do people get competitive? They do, and I've never understood competition in music. I, I just don't like it at all, and it doesn't do anything for me. I don't try to compete. I usually retreat when people start competing. I'm, I'm not a... I'm the same way. I, an athlete <laughs> when it comes to music. Yeah, I've always... I think I, I withdraw from competition, and I think it's partly because I'm very competitive. <laughs> So oh, yeah. I, I have to avoid it. I don't like to lose and I don't like to win. I, I don't, <laughs> I just don't like it. Maybe I'm not competitive. I just yeah, don't want to be in that arena. And that's why, yeah. that, Lauren, our time is coming. Start. Okay. This is a challenge for you, Berkeley. Okay. <laughs> How do you convince the kids or adults or whoever you're teaching that collaboration is what has to happen collaboration can you create collaboration projects mm -hmm. i'd love to hear about the lauren passarelli collaboration project it's this <laughs> <laughs> it's what we're doing but now but even with your students you know if they could yeah. all if they could be in what's the best number for a group of musicians well i only teach classes at the size of eight Perfect. Perfect. So, yeah. <laughs> Get those eight, because eight's an infinity loop. Oh, that's true. Get those. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with infinity loops. I have these tiny infinity loops. You see? Oh, that's cool. Very nice. <laughs> Looks like a little pair of glasses. <laughs> it, was, it was holding 
parts of a solar lamp together and I <laughs> it's an infinity loop I'll keep it <laughs> it's a nasal loop <laughs> we're so serious aren't we we are, um, we are. <laughs> but yes everyone listening folks find ways to seek partnership and collaboration because competitions was killing the world and apparently you know this is getting to be old hat but darwin was wrong about <laughs> about survival of the fittest it's that's not what brings out survival collaboration is what creates survival yeah and um we've got to figure out ways to collaborate and, and then that, that gets rid of fear too that was one of the best things i heard about new yorkers if somebody gets a flat tire or something, people just pull over and help each other because they know it's so hard to make it in the city. So they look out for one another. I thought, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, you know, I think people naturally are that way. Yeah. I think most of the people really are good, you know. If someone's in trouble, I think most people will run to help. Most. I mean, apparently, you know, you read all the time about <clears throat> someone being beat up and passers by just avoiding it and and maybe that's fear but i think our nature is to want to help mm. <clears throat> so yeah let me let me know how your collaboration project comes along so we <laughs> keep me posted on it. well i think they're moving in that direction a lot i just had a, one of these talks with stephen weber and he was saying he was trying to he he started a new major over at berkeley new york city at the power station recording studio where there's a whole new He's major should I have heard of him, Stephen Weber? I'm not trying to know who he is. Not necessarily, just saying who he is. <laughs> um, he's in New York City at the Power Station Recording Studio, which is now part of Berklee College of Music. And uh, he said that the songwriters there are all being taught to write by committee, basically. You know, it is a collaboration because that's what a lot of people are doing out in the world. You, if, you, if you get to see the credits of a songwriter, there's quite a few writers on a lot of the new songs and uh, one's making the beats, one's doing the production, one's arranging the synth parts, someone else is writing or three people are writing the lyrics, two people's working on the bass. I don't know how they're doing it, but um, a lot of collaboration going there, perhaps. So do you collaborate where you live at all? See, I live in a co-housing village. Hmm. And there are 30 families. And that also helps sustain me. Oh, that's good. I, I'm right on the edge of something called Bidwell Park, which is, you can maybe picture it if you saw Robin Hood, Errol Flynn's Robin Hood. <laughs> cool. If I did, I filmed, wouldn't remember it. <laughs> filmed here. And so we're Sherwood Forest of oh. Errol Flynn's Robin Hood, right, right out my back door. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you might want to see it and you'll you'll see Errol Flynn battling or Big John or Little John battling with someone at, essentially in my backyard. But so I'm in a co-housing village and it's we do everything by consensus and it's a good model. It it slows like things it. down, but yeah. <laughs> it slows and, things down, that's for sure. <laughs> uh a miracle that we were able to create this place in fact i don't know how it happened because now we can't make one decision without 10 meetings <laughs> did i ask you about uh if you do crossword puzzles or the wordle or some of those things that are you did not ask me and i don't i oh, yeah i don't either i've never liked games oh I yeah i never really liked games either <laughs> again i don't like to win or lose and uh... you know, I played Monopoly with my grandsons and I scared myself because I was so capitalistic. I ended up with all these hotels and and, <laughs> I, and I just clobbered them and I felt horrible. It was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I was rich. <laughs> <laughs> but I won. <laughs> but, but I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't. So uh, Me and my brothers had that game and a couple of other games with the fake money in it we put all the money together once and played monopoly and it was boring because everybody could afford everything <laughs> interesting you know if we end up being the way we need to be taking care <laughs> of everybody and and it stops being competitive we'll have to find a way to not <laughs> 
I mean, there are people who think that even war uh, keeps men excited and happy. <laughs> You know, we've got to, I think we got to move away from the male, the masculine <laughs> dominant thing. It's so anyway, sweet. I don't know how long you'd like to go, but I'm thinking we're going to, I guess nobody has to watch the whole, the whole, our whole, we can just go on into the night. <laughs> <laughs> it would be fun to be neighbors. Yeah, it would. <laughs> it would be fun to collaborate on a song and, and a poem. Yeah, yeah. Come over for tea. <laughs> and pot roast. No, <laughs> I don't make pot roast. <laughs> I was I thinking of stew, a, a nice stew in the fall. <laughs> what about vocabulary or etymology? Were you always a big... Where do these words come from? I, How many I do love word? that. I do love etymology. I do. I have an OED and I'm so good at reading. I can't see distance, but I can see close up. And I, I do love etymology. In fact, I was just finding a page where I wrote about the word silly. Uh -huh. Originally meant blessed. It's what it originally meant? Wow. It was blessed. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And a lot of words, you know, I think in Poem Crazy, I mentioned it and I've heard it since. Words get very, very modified and often lose their punch. Mm. Um, the word abracadabra, for example, you know, I, I have a chapter about it in Poem Crazy. It's like bibbity bobbity boo, uh, shazam. But what it really comes from is Aramaic. Oh, wow. And the meaning is abra, it's abrak adhabra. And a rabbi told me exactly what it means in Aramaic. I will create as I speak. Oh, wow. That's good. And it's about the power of invocation and a power of, and the native nice. people knew this as well. Wow. And in fact, I have it. Let's see if I have that near me. I have a book called Prayers of the Cosmos. Let me see if I can find that. Where did I put that, Emma? Mochi, I mean. Here it is. This is an amazing book. Oh, and I'm glad it came out right now because I like to bring it to my workshops. Mm. Um, and I'm doing that workshop Saturday. And it talks about the Lord's Prayer by a man named Neil Douglas Klotz. Mm. Name Klotz. <laughs> poor baby the clot to clot <laughs> my friend jane J june changed her name she married i think just to get rid of the name farkas okay yeah that would be a good idea <laughs> but but <laughs> the idea is we've really messed up translations by taking them into the greek and roman from the aramaic and the lord's mm. prayer i know a little bit of it by heart in Aramaic was abun de boashmaya neth kadashmach ketete malkuthach and taken back to the Aramaic and translated. It's not our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's more mother, father. I'll read how he has it here. O birther, father, mother of the cosmos, you create all that moves in light. Mm. It's gender free, mother, father, birther of the cosmos, the breathing life of all, creator of the shimmering sound that touches us. There we've got that frequency. Mm. The sound. Because a lot of people think everything came from sound. That makes sense. Have you heard about the people who, the Ek Ekankar people who chant hue? Have you heard of Ekankar? Yes. Because yes. that they, they think that's the primal sound. Um, source of sound in the roar and the whisper in the breeze and the whirlwind we hear your name radiant one you shine within us birther father mother of the cosmos and it's a lot different than this separate mm -hmm. father art in heaven hallowed be thy name masculine removed mm -hmm. yeah. so we've been buying and I, you know we've been buying a bunch of bill of goods <laughs> yeah 
Have you ever heard uh, some of the thoughts about law of attraction or the teachings of Abraham Hicks? Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding? I'm immersed in all that stuff. Yeah. Love all that stuff. And I love um, knowing more about the brain, like uh, Dana Wild has a great podcast that you could listen for free on YouTube as well. It's D-A-N-A-W-I-L-D. E. W I L D E. Uh huh. Yeah, Dana Wild, and uh, she talks about the reticular activating system in the brain, the RAS, and how the brain's always trying to, like, wait for an assignment to give us everything that we're thinking about or talking about. So it's like if you don't tell your brain what to focus on, like my friend Kate Chadbourne is an excellent musician and poet and writer, and she probably would have loved to have been on this call with us, but she. Um, she says, Earth is focusing school. And our focus is like the strongest, coolest, most powerful tool we have. And it reminded me of your absolute definition there of abracadabra. I will create as I speak because you have what you say. You have what you think and it creates who you are and all, all of that. So do you know who Mike Dooley is? Oh, love Mike Dooley. <laughs> <laughs> He's another Aquarius. Yeah, I, I'm. He's I get, another Aquarius. I get his notes from the universe, and I've done his vision boarding. I love him. Yeah. Yeah, the um, vision boards are pretty intense. I I was making little collages my whole life, and I have been amazed that I have lived into a lot of those collages and didn't realize there was a thing called vision boards. <laughs> like it works well, whether you know about it or not. Kind of like gravity, you know. Well, like the land that I have, I do something called the inner guide meditation that I've been doing since the 80s. Hmm. It's a system, and, and that's my guide, Josie, that I was showing you. She's my fifth guide. She's the one that will actually take me out. She doesn't like me to draw her, but I do it anyway. <laughs> but she's formless. Um, but I see her with her arms, always with her arms up. And my first guide, Micah, would take me to a hill, and he called it the larger place. And I have oh, a chapter cool. in my new book called The Larger Place, and it might even end up being my subtitle. And um, from the hill and the larger place, I could see myself. I could see my mom and dad who committed me. I could see my husband bumbling around below doing the best we can. And would I, and then I, my third guide, Leon, would take me like an otter on his chest and swim me um, in a healing pool. Well, I've ended up with this land with the hill on it, the gentle hill with a healing pool on top. It manifested. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't trying to, I was just there. I was there with my guide on this larger place. And I realize now, my God, it's taken form. Wow. And it's discovered, it's an old Machupta Maidu village and I'm in touch with the Machupta Maidu people and my friend Isaiah, who's part of the tribal council is bringing the Maidu back to this place. And, and not only is it incredible, but it gives my book a good ending. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, I I mean... what I was looking for all my life in land was exactly what native people were looking for. I wanted springs. I wanted a year round creek. I wanted a, huh. a, a view. And there was no way to find that, except then we had all these fires. And so yeah. this ranch burned down. <laughs> oh my goodness. So my mom and I bought this burned down ranch for very little. And it turns out to have the magical hill and mm. we poured the pool and you'll have to come see. <laughs> it could happen. You ever come to California? I do every once in a while. <laughs> Let me know. I will I'll show you a picture of the pool on the hill. It's incredible. Um, so yeah, things. I think when we what what this fellow Neville. Do you know about Neville Goddard or Vernon Howard? Yeah, sure. They say you have to just be there, and that's yeah. when it manifests. You yeah. put yourself there. And so I wasn't trying. I think sometimes trying gets in the way. Do you, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, it's more like feeling it and not grasping or yearning for it. Just sort of a, I'm okay where I am, 
but l allowing yourself to dream and enjoy the image of that dream. There's something about letting yourself go into it deep enough that you almost feel it or taste it. It becomes, you're, you're not making it become real. You're, it's already real. You're just trying to draw it out into this particular realm where you can see it and feel it and touch it. In a way, that's what writing a song is, isn't it? It is. I would think the whole this whole creative process is that. That's why I feel like we're magicians and we're <laughs> we're certainly uh, alchemists, turning pain into beauty and finding scraps and turning it into art, like you're doing. Yeah, you know? that's what my book is about, and that's what the Fool's Gold was about. Yeah, right, right. Um, I'm just trying to find you the right picture of the hilltop maybe i can even find one with isaiah in it the maidu guy yeah so we'll be doing it all at once and, and even just leaving things better than you found it like trying to make the world a better place i i like that there it is ah, here's the pool on the hill oh my goodness yeah let's see you can't really see the How hill far away is this it's, it's about just about 15 miles from here, from where I am. Okay, so you're gonna eventually fix that up and move there? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, eventually it will be, here's my friend, uh, my friend uh, Jason and his partner, Lauren, that were planning to get married up there. That's cool. But the weather didn't, the weather didn't um, allow, it was in a January, but I think eventually it will go back to the Maidu, the Machupta Maidu people, because oh. they wants the Maidu to have first right of refusal, and oh. it's 30 acres. It's tricky to main. I mean, I'm, I just got back. My finger's still sore from pulling star thistle the other day, so. Oh, yeah, you can't take care of all that. Project, I'll tell you. But I my have sister, nearly two acres here, and I don't take care of much of it. You know, it's like, you just got to let it be. <laughs> we have that pool area which is like fenced in there's a chapter called fences about creating a green ring and hmm. that are connected uh, taken care of and then there's a cabin at the bottom of the hill hmm. house that my son built if you know anyone who wants to re have a retreat there there you go um and that we also were you know we have a like that's fenced in also just because they've got a garden there and here i'll show you a picture of that hmm. It's a little two-story tiny house, <laughs> meadow. Oh, that looks so cool. There's the hill behind it, the larger place. So, yeah. When did you guys buy it? I bought it with my mother I in know. 2011. Oh, wow. So you've had it a long time. 10 years, 11 years, yeah. How long do you go? How often do you go there? Not so much anymore. I mean, I, my book is about it. My my book is about this place. And okay. it's about writing as discovery. But, but my punchline for the book or my pitch is I bought a burned down ranch with my 92 year old mother and I'm writing this book to find out why. <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> How did you convince her? Maybe she was into it before you were. My mother <laughs> was always loving the Wild West. Um, and, and starting when I was 19, I tried to talk my parents into buying a little Greek villa. I had a Greek boyfriend. And I mean, <laughs> it would be worth millions of dollars now. It was in Monombasia. But they thought, what? What? So $2,000 for this little villa in this island in the peninsula of Monombasia. <laughs> So I've been trying to talk my parents into helping me buy something for a long time. And and <laughs> mom was moving to California and this just tickled her fancy. And um wow. and it turns out to heal, it healed our relationship. That's what the book's about. Oh, because, that's beautiful. Because I never ever quite forgave my parents for locking me up. Sure. There was nothing else to do with me. I was bonkers. <laughs> well, you probably just were being kept in a box and not able to do your work well I was in far. grief I was in grief my love was sent to Vietnam oh and I was in Barnard College on Broadway and and Joel was drafted out of Peace Corps training and and my Greek dream the year before had 
collapsed. I'd been totally in love with this Greek man and I wanted to live in Greece and everything that I loved was disappearing. And oh. he's hard. I was only, how old was I, 19? And then yeah. Vietnam, I mean, my love was, my fiance was drafted out of Peace Corps training and sent oh. to Vietnam. It's kind of healthy to have a breakdown in that situation. That's a big one, yeah. Did so, come back? you know, he came back, but not quite who he was. And and I think I didn't forgive him for going because I, I had the thought that I wouldn't go. There was no way that I would go. Mm. Did he have a choice? Probably not. Well, you don't have a choice, but no, you, you not when you're say, I'm not going. And then what do you do? You go to jail, right? Right. So I would have gone to jail. I would not go to war. Yeah. Yeah. Take me here. Take me. <laughs> <laughs> you have to deal with me in prison. <laughs> I'm not easy. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure about that. I don't think I, there's no way I'd go. No. Would you? No. <laughs> what if they say, well, you're going to go to jail? What would you say? I probably would have been in jail too. Yeah. So it was partly a, it, it burst my idea of who he was. It, it, you know, and so I just chose to have a nervous breakdown. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's the most natural thing to do. <laughs> you were talking there earlier about offense. It reminded me of how um, oftentimes if you can figure out the form of something that you're trying to create, you can fill it. Do you ever think of it in terms like that? Like I can remember being in grade school and they were explaining to us about what an essay was. And as the teacher read a bunch of essays, my ear caught on to the rhythm of the sentences and the cadence of the words and the amount of syllables bouncing around. And I just thought, oh, I can do that. All I have to do is just find the right words to stick in it, you know? <laughs> I have two chapters about that because my, my right. book writing and it's about the land and and it's about my mother and healing but i have a chapter called fences and it's about containment okay it's about what do you choose to include mm -hmm. and then i have a chapter called buckets which is oh, even right. more about containers and it's about essays what's an essay oh. and i and i talk about not liking the word essay because it sounds sort of brittle yeah. and old and, and i love montaigne he's incredible hmm. um, but I'm not, a, I don't like to call myself an essayist. So I talk about it, uh, prose pearls. It's more like a pearl or it's more like a, a <laughs> casino. It's like a casino. And so I have people choose a word that will then surround what they choose to include. So my book is about writing. Um, we'll see if I can pull it off. It's about. Sure you can. Thank you. You have to. <laughs> well, and, I, and I do have an agent right now who who is maybe right now reading it, and he's great. And uh, Crown Random House has first right of a few refusal; they have the option. And oh, maybe nice. wouldn't that be good if it was a triple Crown? But you know, because uh, I Pwn Crazy and Fool's Gold are both Crown Random House, but right. But now. The whole world of publishing is so weird. I I don't know about I know, the big. It's like the music business. It's gotten pretty carpal. Right? Yeah. How, how did you? Um, I was going to ask if you had any thoughts about publishing or getting a literary agent or anything for anybody who who does write. What they would do now, or what did you do then? How did? Wow, it was so. About? It was so different then. Yeah. When I. When I published Poem Crazy, which was like miracles ha kept happening, I there was no email. Mm. I was FedExing my manuscript back and forth to my agent, and my editor mm -hmm. used a red pen, and she was amazing. I I had the I can't even tell you, Lauren. I I kept saying, this is too good to be true. And, and my friend Sharon said, it's good enough to be true. Fool's Gold was the opposite. But <laughs> was crazy. My agent was wonderful. She she was 24. She's now great. She's she's doing the great American author TV show. Her name is Arielle Ekstad. She was only 24. And she was such a hustler. We worked on it together. 
and she got one of those bidding wars going. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Between Norton and Simon and & Schuster and Random House. I couldn't believe it. That's fantastic. And then my editor, Carol Southern, was Terry Southern's first wife. He wrote Barbarella and Five Easy Pieces and Dr. Strangelove. Right. And so that was kind of like the caliber of, a, I couldn't believe that. I'm going into Random House and in the hallway, there's Black Beauty and Alice in Wonderland. I, and then Carol had this corner office and and I, it was just heavenly. And she worked on every line with me. But then with Fool's Gold, my editor didn't even read it. Ariel sold it sight unseen. The editor never, never read it. Ariel hadn't read it. It was published with no illustration. So I've had tough experiences. I would say now, mm. if you can get an agent, it helps. But my daughter is working for something called the Collective Book Studio. And it's what's called hybrid. Mm. She writes press. And a lot of people are doing that. And you have to pay. Mm. However, you get all the all the money the book makes. In my daughter's company, they're now working with Simon & Schuster for marketing. So mm. you, you have a marketing it, end of it. Self-publishing would be hard if you don't know about marketing. I, I'm not good at that, you know. But I don't know what'll happen now. I mean, even if I went with Crown, who did my other two books, I don't know if they're, apparently they're not marketing the way they used to. I mean, I did events, a, a kind of a book tour sort of thing. It's, it's not happening much anymore. I really don't know what to tell people. Mm -hmm. And I know that I probably would not have a chance with the big publishers if I didn't already have a couple of books with them. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking, or do you, do you know people with books that want to get I out? I do know people that have been writing some books and they're wondering what the next steps are. Yeah. Um, We've all self-published. I mean, we self-publish our music and all that too, but. It's not, it's not that satisfying, is it? Or is it? Well, um, you have the product, right? There you have the product. Right. Even in self-publishing uh, music before everything went digital, it was exciting because, you know, you were able to put your money where your mouth is and uh, believe in your own products and abilities and all those kinds of things. And it would have been nice to have some kind of push or some machinery out there to let it be known because, you know, friends of mine were signed to major labels back in 1987. And the major independents record labels would spend a million dollars a year just on marketing. It took six years to break them and make them a uh, household name, you know, and then as soon as they're on the cover of TV Guide, everybody knows who they are. But there's levels of saturation. There's so many people to tell, right? And now everybody's marketing yeah. something. Yeah. Say that, say that again. It's not so easy to get it out there anymore, is it? Well, yeah. now there's all this social media and you can get things out everywhere, but everybody's putting stuff out everywhere. How many people can you and possibly free. follow? And, and to get paid, I know. I mean, I heard Bandcamp is good for music. I don't know if you know about Bandcamp. Sure. But same with, like, if I'll tell people I've written a book, they say, oh, I've written three books. You know, every everybody's written a book. Yeah, and everybody's putting out music. <laughs> yeah. So It's wild. You know, I mean, Poem Crazy feels a little different to me, but people don't know that it's, you know, so what in, in other people's mind that it's, I mean, except that it has sold a lot. I mean, it's in a 30 second printing. Wow. That's awesome. Well done. Yeah. But, but so what? <laughs> <laughs> well, everything is so what everything is for now and everything is for, for our, us to enjoy and to appreciate and again, coming back to the energy or coming back to the desire, why not say our words and our music are being heard all over the world? Why not just enjoy whatever is coming in? Why not just send it out with love and, and uh, look forward to the collaboration of the magic that's happening? Because there are probably people that are being born into wanting to be in publishing or wanting to be in marketing or wanting to be an agent and, and everything's going to morph into different forms that we haven't quite imagined yet but but That's what i true. tell people all the time about poems in particular 
because it's very hard to get a publisher for poems. And it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme right now because there are more and more little journals being created because there are more and more graduate students coming out of master programs. Mm -hmm. and, and it's gotten so proliferated that it's, you know, you can get your poem into something, but nobody's reading it. So what I suggest to people is that they put out a little book of their own mm -hmm. and then sell it for $10, mm -hmm. give it to everyone they know. And then, mm -hmm. because we're trying to deal with the whole world. You know, yeah. when we were in the tribe, it was an oral culture and everyone around the fire heard our song mm -hmm. and that's all that there was. And so we can go back to that circle and give our poems or our songs to our circle. That's what I recommend, you know. And I just happened to be lucky that I came across, I, I came on the scene when it was still possible. And, and you know, and Michelle Obama's getting out there. I mean, a lot of big names are, but <laughs> if, I, if I even do get a big publisher with the, for this book, I don't know what that will mean. You know? <laughs> yeah, it might be meaning something different. And, and I don't know if I have the oomph to get out there behind it the way I don't tell that to my prospective agent, but to, to do the kind of push I did for Poem Crazy, it, it was in the 90s. It was different. Well, you could do it digitally now. You know, there's lots well, of places I where do. you can do something like this. Yeah. Like I, I am friends with Peter Coyote. I don't know if you know who Peter Coyote is. A lot of people don't. Mm -mm. Peter Coyote. He's... Have you seen any of the Ken Byrne documentaries? Oh, right. He's the voice. Oh, okay. And he was in E.T. He was the doctor in E.T. And okay. he's in a lot of movies, but none of them have been huge hits. He's he's worked with Steven Spielberg, Roman Polanski, did a movie called Bitter Moon. But anyway, I did a Zoom interview with Peter for his book of poems. And again, it was book passage, but it's several thousand people have watched it. And I think that's, that's what's happening now. You know, yeah. it's more like this, like you and me, and then anyone who might be interested in you or me can Google us and watch mm -hmm. the YouTube and It'll get discouraged up. about publishing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's always been like that. If it's a real following or a real grassroots thing, right. And, and the beautiful part about it is there are enough people in the world that have varying tastes they all are going to like something and as long as we're attached to what we're doing there's always someone that's going to like what we're doing and you just find those few people and those are your real people you know exactly. you're not trying to twist anybody's arm to say be my fan <laughs> i mean with me with poem crazy and maybe to a certain extent with this book i've got a little bit of a mission and, and that's what got me to finish poem crazy and i take 10 years on a project and mm. poem crazy was about seven but this one's oh. even longer and my mission with this one one is to help people write memoir help people to see how hard it is to do it well and also it's about land and and how to work with the native people and how to see land but so i'm a little bit of a missionary but for the most part if you're not I mean, that's what motivated me with Poem Crazy because I knew that I had found tricks to help people mm -hmm. write. And you're you're living proof that you have found it helpful. Yes, um, and so. so I I was it was kind of bigger than I was. I I I knew that it would help teachers. I knew that it would help people. And mm -hmm. so that that's a big if you can come up with something that will help other people. Right. It'll help you finish it, and it might help you get it out there. Yeah. And that's maybe that's one reason I'm not writing poems anymore. Mm. I have so many poet friends who are wonderful, and their poems do help people. But but a lot of times, writing a poem is not like staring at your navel. I mean, it, <laughs> it's my chance to be expressive, but it doesn't. Not like song. I think song has a way of amplifying out into the body, as you said. Hmm. sure that a poem does as much I think I don't know I don't want to limit it because there's nothing more wonderful than a great poem oh yeah and a great poem's put to music I don't know if you ever heard one of my favorite poems by Yeats uh I think Judy Collins sang it uh I went out to the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head right it's called 
the song of the wandering angus yes my friend kate chadbourne did a version of it too i can send you a link you can probably you... love her album songs of the poets I, w I would love that send me a link yeah do you, do you um listen digitally or do you have a cd player as well yeah i have a cd player i, I use that in my workshops i i bring my old good old cds to my workshops yeah. i could send you an actual physical cd and her workbook that went with it i would love that you would probably really get i like that but see the thing is you've already been published so i would imagine if you had your own uh books of poems should you care to write them or or anything else that you'd want to put your name on it would just show up everywhere people search for these two books or stumble on these books i do have a book of poems but it was a very small friend press my friend uh beth put it out bear star press and and i think there were so few of them that now it, that you want to buy it it's like 70 dollars or something right. <laughs> so i have some and i'll sell them for seven dollars but um I lucked out. I came in under the wire, yeah. um, my books, and it may give me a ticket with the next one, or it may not. It depends on yeah. the powers that be. Well, you know, doing another book on your own or doing self-publishing things isn't for everybody, but like Amazon makes it really easy. I have two little guitar eBooks through them and they can print them on demand if people want. Them. I think it's a way to go for most yeah, people. So you could do that with poems. I think anybody would buy your poems just because of your name alone. And then that would be your profit, you know, or you I don't just quite them. get it that I have a no name. <laughs> you know, that, that was one thing about my, my book coming out when I was 50 hmm. and, you know, you can add up how old I am when you see when that was. But I was a mom. I was a PTA wife. I I, I just don't quite get it that that anybody that I have a name. I mean, I know that sounds a little um, false modest. One part of me does, but um, and also, I mean, Poem Crazy has sold a lot of copies, but not in the large picture of books. I mean. It's, maybe a hundred thousand max total which is small really compared to the I think of a lot more out than I, albums i've sold <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, i mean that's why it's also relative but like a bestseller will sell millions of copies you know i mean liz gilbert barbara king Oliver, the, the people who are really selling yeah. yeah i don't know about music but so yeah. it's to sell albums i bet i'm sure yeah well, I'm glad you have a good teaching gig. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, there's so many of my friends that went out on tour and I thought, wow, I'm still here. I didn't go on those tours. I was on regional tours and, and toured around for like 17 years doing original things, Beatle cover things, tribute bands and stuff, all that stuff's on YouTube. But um, you can sometimes think the grass is greener somewhere else or think that you've done something wrong or you could have done something another way or someone says something derogatory like, you played it safe, you stayed at Berkeley. And it's like, but it was, you know, like I'm more of a recording artist. I love making records, like making films rather than doing the stage show live and recreating it every night, you know? So like, I don't feel like I've done anything wrong. And now so many of those people are coming back trying to get a gig at Berkeley because they want to settle down and they need health insurance. And you And you've got it. You've done and the right. Said, you did it right all along, and now you have a pension. And they're like high fiving me, and I'm like, huh? You know, like there's, there's so many ways to look at something. But I think that's the beautiful thing if you think about a publisher, or no, like a publicist. I mean, if we had a publicist, no matter what we did, they would always be trying to frame us in the best light. And no matter what thought comes through your mind, it doesn't necessarily mean it's your thought. You know, you can say, well, how does that thought make me feel? that one can bury me or I can think more bad thoughts and spiral down. So it's like, you can take each thought and go, is this serving me? No, let's think something else and just change what you're focusing on. That's why I read the book, loving what is. That's along those lines. Absolutely. Because you can't change what it is anyway. Loving what is, is one of my all time favorite books. And it saves me that in the four agreements, but loving what is, if you haven't read Katie's book, it's very helpful. And, um, and it's kind of just what you're saying. We just have to love whatever's happening. I mean, okay, Harry Styles. But you turn it, you turn it into something that you need, right? So if I take that, if I look at any situation, I can tell the story 
several different ways, infinite different ways, but always tell the story so that it serves you is what the point is. It's like, uh, see yeah. your life as a success. Well, otherwise you're not going to be happy. <laughs> exactly. You don't get happy thinking about everything that could have been and watching every tangent that goes off in every other direction. And then there's someone like Harry Styles, who I'm actually worried about. Another person that I know who had the same thought about him, he's reached the apex. He got more people to show up at a stadium in Scotland than has ever shown up, like 70,000 people. He's doing this world tour called Love, Love on Tour. He's huge. He's got screaming mobs everywhere. <laughs> I think he's going to have a breakdown. Oh, because I mean, that's just my thought. He's another Aquarius. He's everyone he's adores him. Things. He's beautiful. He's putting his heart into every performance. He's going all around the world. And to me, that looks exhausting, easily <laughs> exhausting. And and every night, and you know, Google him, Google, look up Harry Styles, and and that well, I've is. I've heard the name a lot. I just can't hum anything he's done. <laughs> well, is that the answer? No, I think I think we've got it made, honey. Look, here we are. Absolutely. We're surrounded by nature. You've got a puppy. I've got Mochi down here. Yep. We're talking together, and you're. T we're both helping nurture other artists, which is. I think that's what I mean, where it's at. Yeah, it's huge. We're kind of serving. Yeah. And that's what Mike Dooley says. And what, what a lot of people say is that. Absolutely. That's where the happiness comes in, you know, not just for you. So maybe we should <laughs> here, don't you think? Should we close on that? Great note. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you've got you've got your pup back in your lap, which is how we started. So. Well, yeah, he what, comes over like every couple of hours. Like, I need what something from you. What, what a treat. <laughs> Increasing the wilted rose. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll remember the roses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Healing power of the earth. Cool. So thank you, dear. What a blessing. Thank you. And thank I'm going to go listen to some of your music right now. And, oh, and thank you. Thank you. I, I, you know, just always appreciated the emails back and forth and, and all the encouragement and uh your books and meeting you now is just, just it's just great i mean so cool i just wish you all the best and thank you so much you're just kind of the way i thought you'd be am i kind of the way you thought i'd be yeah you just yeah. i mean you know you came through in your your emails as well and certainly your books i felt like i knew you knew you a little bit better from your books but you know people change and you know <laughs> You yeah. could catch either of us on a bad day and it wouldn't be this good, but <laughs> right. but that's blessing, blessings to you, sweetie. So should we leave or are you just you're just gonna end the uh, tape here kind of thing? Yeah, after the, the, the goodbyes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm honored and uh <laughs> and really Berkeley School of Music sounds like the best place. College. And I'm sure Berkeley College of Music. College of Music. And uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure you have colleagues that are wonderful and friends and oh they're extraordinary yeah what a beautiful life yeah it's pretty well, amazing other than i mean the touring life i mean mick jagger good lord he's still doing it <laughs> <laughs> and he's not doing a whole lot of new stuff either is he I mean, the same old same old isn't it oh i, I don't, don't know yeah i don't know either <laughs> i don't know who's <laughs> i think they keep putting yeah. out new records they're still together you know <laughs> Yeah, I love Mick Jagger. He's amazing. They're great, you know, yeah. but that sounds difficult. I, I, yeah, know. I love home. <laughs> Me too. Well, bless you, sweetie. And uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime or let's just stay in touch. And Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll just do it for fun. <laughs> we can zoom now and then. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, so I, I, one thing I wanted to ask you was National Poetry Month. Do you write a poem a day in April? No, you might want to. <laughs> you know, that might be wise. Yeah. Do I'll you? Share which, I'll share, no, my friend Kate does though, and she um, she runs a, a poetry celebration, and you know maybe you'd get a kick out of that too. How lovely! Well, you know, the poet William Stafford wrote a poem every day for maybe the last thirty years of his life. There you just go. It's a practice, yeah. It is a good practice. Yeah. 
No, I do write my no, journal almost every day, but I don't definitely, I'm not writing as many poems, so. Well, you know, you can do anything you want, you know? Sometimes I'm playing guitar, sometimes I'm playing more drums, bass. It doesn't matter, you know, as long you as you're having fun. Thing you want, or are you pretty much there in your house by yourself? I live here by myself, yeah. Yeah, so do I. Yeah. Aren't we lucky? <laughs> yeah, we are lucky. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a guest who's staying way longer than I thought she would. Uh -oh. <laughs> the thing that wouldn't leave. She loves it here, and I'm thinking, eh. <laughs> That's It'll funny. Be three days, it's up to six. It's okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have that happen? You've got a beautiful place in the woods. I bet people want to come stay with you a lot. They don't even mention it. <laughs> but, but when people visit, they go, wow, this is a great place. It's like. Yeah. <laughs> so I do have room, hon. You are invited for three days. <laughs> three days. That's the max. <laughs> What's that Ben Franklin thing? You know, uh, guests and fish for three days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that where that came from? That's funny. Yeah. I think he said, yeah, you, you don't want to guests that shouldn't stay any longer than fish in the refrigerator. Yeah. Three days. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably before refrigerators. <laughs> yeah, probably. So bless you, sweetie. And any any more questions or anything you want to ask? Phone calls are good too. It's fun. Phone yeah. work. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Susan. So cool to see you in person. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.